and I'm going to introduce you to the uh, objectives of the SQRA L2RA process. Kind of describe the process, how you develop the risk drivers doing the SQRA L2RA, and um, how to go through a gut check on where the risks are plotting, and describe how to make the case where they're plotting. So this is sort of like what you do with the information once you've um, uh, done the done what Andy just uh, walked you through. So. Each of the agencies has a risk matrix or a tall risk chart. Uh, looks a lot like this. Um, it's got likelihood on one axis and uh, consequences on the other axis. And how you read this chart is things up that are further to the top and the right are more risky, and things that are the close to the bottom and the left are less risky. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to use this matrix to try and portray the magnitude of the risk to um, ultimately the decision makers, whether it's an owner or regulator. And so you can do two things with that. You can compare failure modes to each other, you can compare projects to each other, and you can manage the portfolio. So you're trying to use all the information that this chart can be used for all those things. Um, so the core, we use it to categorize failure modes. We also use it to prioritize our projects and trying to do risk management. And so there's a lot of things that we're trying to, to achieve with this chart, but um, once you've done the PMPMA and what uh, you just did with Andy, um, this is kind of the comprehensive approach to how we portray risks. Um, to try and um, make the case. So I'm going to walk you through all of those. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop the, the risk drivers, which means the risks that are actually driving the decision on the project. And so what we're trying to do is fully develop each potential failure mode, document the background and performance data that's specifically related to that failure mechanism, document more likely and less likely factors, um, all, this is a really important step. There are forms out there to do that. We, every agency, every entity has, has some sort of way to do this, but they're all fairly similar. Using that information, we estimate the likelihood of failure. We document and consider intervention, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We estimate the consequences, and then we document the uncertainty. What you need is a complete description of the failure mechanism, a step-by-step -step progression from initiation to breach. And you walk through that a little bit. I'm going I'm to describe that here in a minute in detail. Um, it includes a location and a pathway, so I, please, please draw what you're doing. Anytime you're doing a failure mechanism, please draw this. Having a fully developed failure, failure description, failure mode description, and a drawing will give your team a more common understanding, and that's really critical to get through the process easily. Um, my personal opinion is doing an event tree and showing the step-by-step -step progression is a really good way to take the failure mode and make it into a visual um, um, event tree that you can uh, look at probabilities and make it easier for you to estimate the order of magnitude risk you're ultimately going to have to plot on that chart. And then sketch the failure pathway. This is a failure mode description. I'm going to walk you through this in gory detail. Because if you don't do this right, you're not going to be able to do any of the rest of it right. You're not going to be able to do the risk assessment right. It's not going to plot right. And you're not going to be able to make the case well. And it's going to it's going to go badly. So if, if, if I've seen anything go wrong in something that's come through the process that has tripped up teams, this is, this is reason number one right here, not having a good failure mode description. So I'm going to walk you through this um, because uh, we're going to create an event tree based on uh, the words that are in this. So, so in this case, the example of failure mode is this. There's a continuous defect present through the levy embankment along or below a pipe due to poor pill fill placement and compaction. So somewhere in the foundation next to the conduit, there's a flaw. Right, The river stage rises and loads the defect and introduces flow through the defect with sufficient velocity to initiate concentrated leak erosion. So water initiates the failure mechanism and starts it off. Erosion continues as seepage exits unfiltered the land side face of the embankment. So that's a continuation. That'll be an event tree node. As the seepage and erosion increase, the penetrated pipe and or the embankment material support a stable roof and sidewalls, allowing for crack and enlar to enlarge progressively. Erosion progresses without plugging or flow limitation. So at some point, this internal erosion fl uh, flaw that we started with is progressing its way from the downstream to the upstream along the pipe that's creating a roof. So there's enough uh, velocity to, to, uh, to make that go. There's enough uh, a long enough roof to, for it to go, and there's nothing hit, that it'll hit upstream that'll stop it from progressing all the way to the water source. Um, detection and intervention are unsuccessful. So there might be opportunities in some failure mechanisms for you to see things that happen early or not. Um, 
or do something or not. And so we talk about, so there is a step in there about looking at intervention, see what we can do about it. Um, on levees, this happens a lot because we do see sand boils a lot. So sand boils are usually an early indication of some things that are happening. So um, intervention is, is a, a big deal on levees. So gross enlargement leads to the collapse of the embankment and lowers the levee crest below the flood level. The levee breaches, resulting in consequences. So some, at some point, you have to get to um, uncontrolled release. So we can take that paragraph. Uh, and draw it up and put it into an event tree. So everything that I just read in, in that thing is in, is in here with a couple little extra uh, words. But graphically, it looks like this. There's a flaw, right? There's a continuous flaw along this, uh, along this conduit. Water's exiting here. There's enough water on this side to drive it. It starts eroding. It works its way back. Um, and there's a sufficient roof, right? So the conduit easily can provide a roof for, for these things. And then as it progresses, the erosion hole gets larger and larger and causes a, um, a massive breach. So you build that into inventory. Each of, those, each of those pieces of the paragraph can be an inventory branch. You can create that as much as you want. Terminal erosion is actually pretty well schemed. If you go on the RMC's website, there's a lot of failure mechanisms, and they'll guide you through how to create inventory, inventories for each of the internal erosion mechanisms that, we're, that are out there. So, um, but but. That paragraph, this graphic, and this event tree are a really good way to make sure your team is on a logical path towards success. So when we're doing that, we're trying to document what, what performance and what background information is relevant to the failure mechanism we're looking at. And so it could be some design details you have, could be some construction photos that you have or some construction information you have, some even spec specifications from the original construction. You should know something about the geology or geomorphology. You should know some of the geometry. And there may be some pre previous analyses, whether it's seepage analysis or stability analysis, some previous analysis you can look at. It gives you some background that's related to the failure mechanism you're looking at. You also might have some performance information, um, how it's operated, what water levels you've seen, what the instrumentation is shown, right? So we spend a lot of time in instrumentation. Whether you see any monitoring, or there have been visual clues of anything, have you seen seepage areas, have you seen some sort of evidence of distress, there are a lot of things that go in there, but they need to be relevant specifically to the mechanism you're looking at. So you should know things like how often does the pool come up, how often does the water come up, has, what's been the record pool, number of times the levee system has been loaded to certain percentages of height. And I'll talk about why that's important here in just a second. A couple of things for levees are Knowing what the maximum water surface the project has ever seen is really important because we'll try to anchor it here in a minute. How often the root pool comes up on dams is also important. So there's a lot of information you can use to start at anchoring and sort of narrow down the possibilities of what the probabilities are going to be for each of the mechanisms. So while you're doing these and we're going through each of those inventory branches or each of those parts of that paragraph, you're documenting what the more likely and less likely factors are, meaning more likely to progress to failure or less likely to progress to failure. In many cases, the evidence will be more heavily weighted one way or the other. Um, but in a lot of times, we one factor will be more important than that. And so we tend to bold those factors because we're going to use that to make the case later. So you need to address that at every node in the PFM description or in the event tree. Um, so what we're trying to do is make sure you're consistent with what drove the annual probability, annual probability of failure estimates that you're coming up with. So what you're trying to do is just incrementally document more and less likely as you're trying to win your way down towards what the ultimate, likely, ultimate probability of failure will be. So some cautions with that. One is using vague terms like infrequent or remote, low, very long, short duration, moderately plastic, kind of fast. Um, really don't help you in the long run. You, you probably ought to include some more specificity like what is the hydraulic head divided by the seepage path length so you can get the gradient, um, duration in hours or days, plasticity index, erosion rates, things like that that are a lot more specific than just um, uh, verbal descriptors. Um, at this point, well, in the process, we're not really talking too much about uncertainties. We kind of we circle back to that because you don't want to really mix uncertainty when you're trying to describe your failure mechanism and get some of your likelihood estimates. So, um, 
what we're trying to do is take all this information, the background information that we have, some of the Dan Levy experience of the team, knowledge of some of the precedents. So we're trying to turn and look at, you know, relative likelihoods, some base failure rates that we have in, in, the, in history. What we know about the loading and the consequences, the information we have about the potential failure mode, what we learned on the site visit and our knowledge risk assessment, we're just proceed to risk estimation blindly and crazily. This is what we typically like to do is our elicitation process. So, um, and, and I say elicitation, but we often have a lot of some analysis that goes along with it. There are some tools on RMC's website that guide you towards some, some probabilities that you can start with. So what we're trying to do is combine the probability estimates that you can get from some analytical tools, but also some subjectivity because it's all a little bit unique to your structure that you, you're going to have to adapt. Our best practice is conduct your first round of, list of estimating uh, probabilities anonymously. It keeps, it, it keeps individuals, especially strong individuals, from anchoring, having an anchoring bias on the overall probability. Um, and then we discuss, you, you talk about them. You all look at them, you discuss the outliers, discuss what made people um, anchor their probabilities where they did, share their initial responses. It actually encourages group discussions, uh, happens a lot. Um, and it provides some insight. So people have different perspectives. They come at it with different backgrounds. It's really valuable to go through this. And then if you need to, you conduct a second round of, of probability estimates. What you're trying to get to is a team consensus. And um, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the risk assessments I've seen have come to a team consensus. There are situations where there's been a minority report where the teams really can't come to an agreement, where there's a really disagreement, and it's usually about geology, honestly. Um, where you have to present to decision makers that there's a difference of opinion. So keep that in mind. Well, I take that back. Structural engineers, you're just as guilty of that. That's not true. Yeah. So we're trying to estimate a likelihood of failure. Easy way to do this, hands down, especially for levees, is find the critical loading. So what you're trying to find is you're trying to find a water surface where the structural performance will change or where you think the structural performance will change and anchor yourself on that. And then you can um, expand and extrapolate that and go forward. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, what's the, what's the loading condition that's most likely to lead to failure or breach? And so if you, can, if you can identify that, it makes everything a lot easier. And that'll get you pretty quickly to an order of magnitude probability estimate for each node of the event tree. It's actually a lot easier than it sounds. Other things you can do, you can do some comparative analysis. So if you're a little struggling a little bit with some of uh, where you're at and how, how your mechanism is going, you can look at historical failure rates for dams, but you have to consider what the population is. And there is some data out there on failure rates for, and for, just for certain failure mechanisms, but it's I'm not going to say it's great. One thing you can also ask anchor to is the annual frequency of overtopping for levees. We can pretty easily figure out what the what the overtopping frequency is and you can compare your probability estimate to that and actually it gives you a lot of insight into how serious something is there is some guidance on this on the in the sqra uh, section on the rmc's website on the critical loading especially we look for the loading condition that creates the highest likelihood of failure when you pair with the system response um, so you start with the aep of the loading and then you reduce that probability as you move on, right? So you, you put that at the beginning of the event tree about the probability of loading, and you reduce every time you go through the next event tree, that probability goes down based on um, you know, what you're estimating or if you have any analysis. Some things you should look out for, you need to consider the headwater-tailwater relationship because a lot of times during floods, the tailwater comes up, it changes a lot of how the structures perform, um, and it changes the head. A lot of times we have seismic and flood loadings happening at the same time that, that have to that go through this. You do, do need to consider the joint probability of those happening. That does change it a lot. Um, there are not a lot of levees that have seismic issues. There are a lot of dams that do, right? So they're depending on what part of the country you're in. So you need to be careful about how you do the joint probabilities of those things. So what you're trying to get to, though, ultimately, is an order of magnitude estimate, which is actually a pretty big range if you think about it. And so right now, <clears throat> if you were to plot this, the total risk up here, this is what this means in, in English. Your total risk is right here. This right here is the historical failure rate for dam, all dams worldwide, which is 
one in 10,000 per year. And it's been pretty stable for quite a long time. So what you say when you plot it up here is you're saying, man, this, the likelihood of failure for this structure is 10 times higher than the average dam in the United States. And think about the average dam in the United States. It's not like Hoover Dam, right? It's, it's farm dams. <laughs> it's everything, right? So it's a pretty strong statement, frankly. So you got to be really careful about what these numbers mean when they come out the end. And you need to take, take a close look of, about what you really think that means. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about this um, a little bit later with some of the other categories on here. But when you're doing the order of magnitude estimates, um, it's, it's good to get it in a reasonable spot compared to what you're actually showing and what you're actually calculating. There, you can do a similar process for economic risk um, where you have um, dollars on the bottom here, but there is no tolerable limits for economic risk. So it, it just gives you some information. It doesn't really give you, it doesn't really give you some anchor to compare to. So, in best practices, chapter 84, there are failure likelihood categories for dams. So, how you read this is, is you use a verbal descriptor. This is what it means, an annual probability of failure. And this is the description you use. So, this is one way we can get into one of, one of those boxes. You can use this on either uh, dams. Well, this is for dams, but you can use the same thing on levees. Um, for FERC, chapter 18 has a little bit of a longer uh, uh, table, but it has uh, failure likelihood categories, FL1 through FL7, and it has a description in there, and then what it means annually probability failure-wise. So this is a good way to do a, a gut check about where you're at um, when, you get, when you ultimately plot the total probabilities. If any of you guys know Dr. Greg Becker from the University of Maryland, he, this is actually, this chart here is from his PhD thesis in, at MIT, and he hates it when we use that chart, but um, but he did publish it, so it is his fault. He has this cute little thing down here of dams. So what he was trying to do is compare some of the major uh, catastrophes in his uh, PhD thesis, actually. And uh, he put dams in here about 10 to the minus fourth, and, and, and there have been a lot of studies, actually. Not, there's one on, from 2017 that's not on here. And it's been remarkably stable. And so we are trying to, be, to keep everything in context, right? So one of the fundamental concepts in the core is we're trying not to add to your background risk. Like you have a risk from dying from a lot of things. Um, um, Center for Disease Control published mortality, morbid, morbidity, mortality rates for everything every year. Um, and we're trying not to add to your background risk. That's one of our fundamental concepts. So at one in 10,000, um, we're not doing too much of that. So once you do all the calculations, plot all this stuff, make sure everything seems reasonable. You need to actually come up with a failure likelihood rationale. So you're trying to synthesize the pertinent information, the background data, and build the case for why the likelihood of failure makes sense. So you'd have to discuss the piece of evidence that drove the estimate to where it is. And you need to do it in enough detail that a, a new team could pick up the report 10 years later and understand what the previous team was thinking, right? Um, that's a really important aspect of it. Stating the assumed critical loading and the susceptibilities of the dam and the foundation make it vulnerable to each potential failure mode is really important. Um, that's some of the reports that uh, were originally um, that have been done quite some time ago. That has been a really hard thing to figure out. And I'll say that that is what your assumptions are when you're going through, your, when you do your estimating for your p potential failure mode, end up being really important. All right, so now we're talking a little bit about intervention because it's it's important. So in core, we prepare risk estimates for both with and without intervention to help understand how much intervention is playing into our decisions. At the same time, we use the with intervention estimate to do all of our decision making, but at least we have, we can tell you what it is without it. And then we assign our safety or our classification with the with intervention scenario. Bottom line is the role that intervention has played, especially in levies, um, to, to reduce the probability of failure is actually a lot. We do a lot of flood fighting every year, a lot. Um, and it does play into what the risk is. And so you need to spend some time on it. Same time for dams. Um, and I don't know about FERC's portfolio, but I know about the CORE's portfolio and Reclamation's portfolio. There's been a lot of intervention on those as well. Um, there have been a lot of sinkhole discoveries that have been uh, kept from progressing to failure. So intervention is a real thing. It should be considered in the probability it's part of the risk. So consequences. So 
when you're going through, you, you, have a, you may have a variety of consequence information, and it may not match your failure mode, and your water surface may not match what the assumptions were when they did the consequence estimate. So you've got to be really careful when you're looking at it. But what you're trying to do as a team is look at the appropriateness of what the existing consequence model says when you're doing your risk assessment, and then you're trying to estimate the order of magnitude consequence from that. You may have to make some adjustments from what the consequence, from what the consequence analysis says based on the conditions of your specific failure mode and the loading condition that's critical. So you need to really spend some time with the consequence estimate. I know for some reason, um, life loss and fatalities freak engineers out. Um, they get really nervous talking about it, but um, having talked about it for about 30 years now, it's a lot, lot less scary now. But the the reality is you need to know as much about the consequences as you know about the system response. And that's a really important thing for the team to do. So for FERC, you can use one of three ways to get to consequences. One, you can use the descriptive approach on the table to the right based on verbal descriptors. Two, you can use an empirical approach that uses results of case history data to estimate fatality rates. Is typically done through uh, RSEM or some other DSO 9906 or some other empirical approach. Three, you can use a simulation approach that models life loss. Um, that's what the core uses. We use life sim. Um, we also, you can use life safety model that BC Hydro has um, when it works. Um, but so those are three ways you can get consequences. Um, there, honestly, if you have something with really low population at risk, you can use some really crude empirical methods, and that'll work as well. It just you need to scale your effort of the consequence analysis to the, to the decision you're going to make, just like you do uh, any other analysis. Just like for failure modes and for system response, you need to build the case for the consequence just as rigorously as you did for um, the likelihood of failure. And there are some really great guidance documents you can find on RMC's website about warning evacuation, how life sim works. In the life sim manual, there's a lot of information about how we get to depth, air, depth velocity curves, shelters in place, and a lot of that stuff. So there's a lot of information out there. Um, you need to use that information to document why the consequence estimate makes sense. It's half of the equation, right? It's, on, it's half of the chart. You need to really spend some time on it. Um, so like I said, you need to look at the consequence, make adjustments if it's appropriate. Some of the key essential elements that you, that you should focus on are where are the people in the downstream areas when the failure mechanism happens? What's the, warrant, what's the evacuation effectiveness? And there's a lot of factors that go into that. What the flood wave or arrival time and the depth and velocity are of the flood that's coming? And what are the ability of the people there to shelter in place? Those are probably the four key things that you need to have discussed in your consequence uh, evaluation. Let's talk about uncertainty. This is literally my least favorite slide. And I've probably read 5,000 risk analyses. Zero of them have said they have high confidence, which is an incredible streak. The four federal agencies developed this concept of confidence, trying to, trying to say, if you, if you portrayed low, if you said that the risk assessment had low confidence, that there's, you, you believe the information was available that would change risk by an order of magnitude if you knew more about it. And I think that's a stretch um, that for most teams, frankly. Um, but most teams put low down anyway. They have low confidence. So um, confidence, I'll say, is if you're really confident that there's information out there that would change the risk by an order of magnitude or more, then say you have a low confidence in the risk assessment. Um, but I'll say that I, I, I'd say most, most teams are actually probably at moderate and that there are a few instances where we really don't know so much about a structure or a failure mode that we would be able to say that. So we had, we had grand designs for this confidence category. Um, it's in best practices. Teams use it. And I won't say I look at it too much. What I do want to know is something about the uncertainty and sensitivity. So I want to know what your imperfect knowledge is. I want to know how different it could be if you use different assumptions. Um, there are some strategies in there about how you talk about uncertainty that are important. What I'm trying to do is trying to figure out as a decision maker, how different a decision would I make if I had different information? And you should be able to convey that in some way. And, and t some teams do a good job of that. Some teams don't do a good job of that. But um, for the most part, I would say uncertainty is a secondary decision consideration for us. Uh, primary is just the mean estimate of risk. 
All right, so this is like the third thing that um, if teams are going to have a bad day, it's, it's here. And that is, do the risk estimates make sense? So I told you I was going to talk a little bit more about what these categories mean. If you're plotting risks in this one in one to one in 10 box right here, or category here, that may, what, you're trying, what you've actually conveyed is um, failure is virtually certain this year unless we take some action. So if you really mean that, we are going to freaking take some action. I'm going to tell you that right now. Um, this next category, 1 in 10 to 1 in 100, this is a really strong state. If you're a flood control facility, you are not providing any protection. It's actually, it might as well not be there. Um, given that it's holding back more water for a little while, it actually may be increasing consequences. That's a pretty strong statement to say that, it, that, it's, that that's what you really mean by that probability estimate. And honestly, there are not a lot of risk trade-offs we're going to take with that. That usually means for us a pretty severe reservoir restriction. Talk about this category, it's about 10 times more, uh, higher than the average dam in the United States. And this, you know, this is a historical failure rate here, one in 10,000. So those numbers mean something. You should pay attention to what they mean. And if it, if it plays into your case, if it doesn't, if you're making a case that, that these risks are really high, but you don't have any evidence that something, you know, something's bad, it's a really hard case to make. And it's really hard for your decision makers to, to take that uh, credibly. So levees have a little bit of a nuance in our tolerability. Um, you know, most of the times when we're looking at dams in the, in between FERC and the core, uh, we're looking at this tolerable risk threshold right here, right? So that's a, this is the societal risk threshold, and this is the probability of failure threshold. Um, there are not many levees that have a 1 in 10,000 overtopping frequency. Most of them, are, I think our average is like 1 in 350. It doesn't make sense to have a 1 in 10,000 probability of failure for a 1, 1 in 350-year levee. So this, the more stringent criteria for the core for levees is you need to be within an order of magnitude of, of the overtopping frequency on your reliability, meaning if you have a 1 in 100 year levee, you need to have a 1 in 1,000 reliability on it. So you need to pay attention to that, to that because on levees, that is almost always the controlling guideline. So you're not trying to get down to 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 100,000 depending on the consequences, you're trying to get to within an order of magnitude, the overtopping frequency is our threshold. So making the case, this is the fourth thing where if you're gonna have a bad day, this is where it falls apart. So you need to make the adequate case that the risk estimates make sense and the characterization risk makes sense, your failure modes make sense, and the recommendations and the path forward make sense, right? So all those things have to like align together and if they don't, it makes for a really weird situation. Um, so all those four things have to align. Uh, the risks themselves, um, the case that's made, and the, the path forward and the hazard. All those things need to really align for you to make a competent case. And if any one of those doesn't make sense with the other ones, it's going to be a really rough day. All right. Back to Socrative to answer a few questions. Okay, we're gonna start with number one. This is a true or false question. The three components required for a complete failure mode description are one, a written description of the step-by-step -step progression, two, an event tree, and three, a sketch of the failure pathway. We've got 36 out of 43 that have answered. I'll give it a second. 93% have selected true. Number two, when using a, the critical loading approach, which two components are evaluated and combined to get the order of magnitude estimate for the failure likelihood? That correct answer is A, one, the annualized exceedance probability of the critical load level that could lead to failure, and two, the system response probability of the structure at that critical load. 96% of you got that correct. Moving on to three, a true or false question. Consequences can be estimated for the project and don't need to be adjusted for the potential failure mode being considered. That answer is false, which about 86% of you got. And the final question, true or false, ensuring that the plotting position of the APF and the recommended actions are consistent with the evidence and the team's thinking is a critical step in making the case. 100% of you have answered correctly with true.